So we're going to start the discussion session on growth. And so you can ask um, Lisa and Kai any additional questions or um, bring up any uh, other topics about growth. So is, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm conducting uh, the airing experiment of yellowfin tuna in Japan, as my colleague commented on the research presentation. And uh, uh, the cage, uh, fish cage is uh, 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 sitting under the natural condition, but in, the, in, the, in that area, uh, there is a, a seasonal change of SST. And in the experiment, uh, we are observing the uh, seasonal change in growth rates. And I'd like, I would like to ask uh, that uh, if it's possible to happen this phenomenon, uh, even under the uh, natural condition. Yeah, so does anyone else have any evidence of seasonal growth in the data they've looked at or um, included in then their stock assessment models or if they know whether their package can actually include seasonal growth? So I guess something definitely worth looking into. Um, does any of the people that have looked at the, the actual growth data um, now that they've identified the actual birth dates of whether they can see any seasonal patterns in growth or anything like that, or looked at the otolith structure to see if there's growth in the otolith structure and seasonal growth. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, in case of the Pacific bluefin tuna, uh, it's a temperate tuna, and uh, uh, it uh, shows uh, very strong uh, seasonal growth. And uh, uh, we could see that uh, kind of uh, uh, growth pattern in the autoless daily rings data. And uh, uh, however, however uh, the longevity of the bluefin is uh, 20 or 25 years. So uh, basically, we are using uh, <coughs> uh, growth modeling uh, using uh, the annual rings data. But uh, uh, we combine those two uh, annual rings and daily rings and uh, uh, develop a single uh, uh, von Bertrand fee growth function and uh, apply that uh, uh, to the stock assessment without seasonality, because uh, in the uh, current uh, stock assessment uh, uh, using a stock synthesis, four uh, K parameters uh, assumed to continue until the uh, uh, asymptotic length, but uh, uh, we are not sure uh, how long the seasonality continued uh, during the life, uh, lifespan. So. Finally, currently, bluefin assessment assumes uh, non-seasonal growth. However, uh, to, uh, to, to come up with uh, some kind of variability in the uh, length at the age, at the young stage, we have somewhat uh, uh, wider range of the uh, variability uh, CV in the uh, length at the age, at the young stage, L1. Yeah. Right, thanks. Uh, Lisa, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, more of a comment about, you know, the value of looking at the actual list, and I think Kai alluded to this with the um, chronologies, uh, because there's, it's definitely observable when there is a period of fast growth. And so whether it be seasonality that we're trying to detect, or the, I was thinking even the two stands of growth issue, it should be in the actual list, and we should be able to see it if it's actually, you know, actually happening across um, across species, across stocks. So maybe we just need to look at the hard parts themselves rather than the actual modeling. And so just out of curiosity, would you see that in your annual aging methods or would you have to look at the daily aging methods? 
Um, for the, if you're interested in two stands of growth, then yes, like we could look at the annual, just the width of those annual rings and the opaque and translucent zones, um, because they would be much narrower if they grow faster. Uh, but if you're interested in seasonality, I would think you'd have to uh, go to the dailies. Um, so you might have some interpolation to do in areas where you can't see anything. Okay, any other comments on seasonal growth? I mean, give, given that it's these are such short lived species, um, seasonal growth might actually be quite important to look at uh, for some of the tunas. Um, and it might also be different in different areas too. There might be more seasonal growth, perhaps in the um, higher latitudes and less in the tropics, but I wouldn't know. Okay, um, any other questions or topics? Um, yeah, I think Phil had his hand up first. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give a brief, I guess, um, anecdote perhaps towards what um, what Simon was talking about and I guess Kai's um, presentation as well around uh, growth variability and plasticity. Um, so I do, I do a lot of work on abalone stocks here and, and power stocks. And I guess they are very well known to be extremely plastic, um, you know, depending on the exact environment that you find them in. And so I guess one thing that we realized a few years ago, so looking across a number of stock assessments that we were doing was that the exact growth data that we were using in each stock assessment was really driving the answer to a large extent. Um, and often that growth data was not particularly representative of that variability that we know exists on a very small scale. So we'd have samples from a few discrete locations in each of the assessment areas, but essentially it, it wasn't really capturing any of that variability that we know exists, um, you know, where the divers are fishing. So w what we ended up doing is essentially um, going away from using either those particular data point or fixed growth in the model and um, essentially do a meta-analysis across growth to try and capture that variability and then use a, use a strong prior essentially in the assessment of uh, informed prior from the meta-analysis um, in the assessment um, to essentially then allow the assessment to, to you know, adjust growth to fit, fit with the rest of the model. And I guess it was, it was kind of a, an experiment initially because I had no idea whether that was even going to work, but it seems to actually work quite well. And I guess I'm just curious whether others have tried that kind of route of, you know, almost, or, or you know, to really trying to um, incorporate that sort of variability in the models. And I guess one thing that I've noticed is that it does tend to obviously lead to a degradation in the amount of information that that you're feeding the model, um, you know, in conjunction with length frequencies, et cetera, about the total mortality and everything else that's that ultimately um, is estimated. But um, but I think it it also gives a, I guess, more honest uh, representation of uncertainty out the other end. So um, so I'm just curious whether anyone else has sort of ha has any, had any experience with that because it, I guess, I, I haven't really come across it elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Anyone want to respond to? that comment and question. No. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, obviously for power, it's a little different because they don't move. So, but um, we do seem to see a lot of variation in length frequency through space. And so the question I have related to that is, does that difference in length frequency mean, well, growth, let's say, call it growth, um, does that mean there's separate prop populations so they don't um, interact much and therefore you should be modeling them as separate populations? Um, if that's the case, then that's kind of easy to deal with. But if they still interact and there's different um, growth in the different areas and that provides different length frequencies, then we kind of got ourselves into a big mess because depending on where the link frequencies are coming from, we're going to get a different answer. And if our growth curve doesn't came from the area where the link frequencies are coming from, then obviously we'll get it wrong. Um, 
one way to get around that might be to move to estimating the ages outside the model using spatially explicit age length keys, which kind of goes back to the traditional cohort analysis type of approach. Um, and I was wondering if anyone has any thoughts on that. Where's Nick? Is Nicola here? I... Ah, you have some thoughts on that. <laughs> I didn't think I had strong thoughts on it. <laughs> I think it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, probably one that I'd need to think more about. So we have a question online, Lisa. Uh, yeah, and just more comment on your on your comment. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of those regional age link keys. I think that actually might be a good way out of it. But uh, again, it's data intensive, so I don't think we'll get there unless we start doing mass aging with again, you know, new tools. Because um, if you have sh small sample sizes and age link keys, again, you're running into issues because you need an annual key. Um, and you need a regional key now, annual and region. Um, but I think that would probably be a good idea for things like Skidjack because uh, at least in the Atlantic, we're seeing huge differences in growth and a lot of movement. And it doesn't look like it's different. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not so much, um, it, it appears that they go to certain places and then feed, for example, there and then grow really fast and then move somewhere else. So um we can't ignore that connectivity um and then i had another thought but i forgot so i'll put my hand down so if we don't have enough data to do something like that how do we overcome the issue of having spatially varying length frequencies and growth yeah nicola I realize that I actually do have thoughts on this. Um, so something that's done that's underway in the in the North Pacific uh, for the ISC Bill Fish Working Group is a is a joint sampling program uh, between uh, Japan, Taiwan, and the U.S. to uh, get uh, billfish, um, the three main assessed species across across the North Pacific, and to specifically look at this question of spatially varying growth, so um, getting the biological data, but then the second step is, is setting up an estimation model. Um, and this is being done in a, a spatial temporal context, so borrowing the ideas from CPUE standardization, and, and rather than standardizing CPUE, you're, you're standardizing your, your growth estimation. Um, and from this process, you can, as as Mark suggests, you can you can generate spatial age length keys for you know any point in your in your model domain, assuming that you believe the the estimated correlation structures and and everything that you've put into the model. But I guess from that aspect, it it is possible to to do this, and then you could feed that into your model. So yeah, I do have thoughts. <laughs> Okay, is is that something that we should be just doing outside the model? Or could we do it inside the model? So having for each, say, length frequency data set we input into the model that was spatially explicit, even though we might not have a spatially explicit model, the data was basically explicit, we could then fit to it using a different growth curve. So the growth curve was actually spatially explicit in the model and the data was spatially explicit in the model but the model itself wasn't spatially explicit to try and do an integrated approach rather than a two-step approach 
Yeah, Simon. So kind of going back to uh, an areas as fleets approach, but having your um, aid structure or the, you know, the capture aid structure and so on defined. Yeah, it seems like a good idea because it's it's going to be really hard to estimate movement rates. Um, you you lose all the information from the size data and and on movement, which which is probably a good thing. And um, there's not that much tagging data, so yeah, it's probably a good option. Okay, something to think about. Maybe too complicated to do, but. Yeah, Dan, you had a question before on a probably a different topic. Yeah, but I was just thinking about what you were saying before about this. But but what you're doing in the end, if you're doing this in a still in a spatially aggregated model, how are you gonna link different growth to the fish? Because the, the, the growth you're using the model is not just to fit in the size frequency data, right? You have, still have to convert the numbers to biomass, that sort of thing. You still has to link in the different growths to different fish in your partitions, right? So. Well, you, I, I'm not sure, I haven't thought this through. I just thought it now, so. Um, but presumably you can convert the, it into weight for that particular fishery too, using that growth curve. So all you're doing is trying to get from the length frequencies and the catch to the number of fish in the age structure of those fish that were killed. So it might work. The only thing is you have spatially explicit, you know, each of the four regions have different growth curves. And whether doing that inside the model or outside the model, conversion, um, is something to think about and also whether you fix those growth curves in the model or you're estimating the growth curves in the model somehow and then what information was used to estimate those growth curves you have to integrate that into the model so i don't know yeah simon i guess if you have got different growth curves in different areas that are maintained to that extent that you can see really large size distribution large distributions of size patterns, then maybe there's not that much movement on the one, on one hand. And then if you're using an areas as fleets model, you're assuming that everything's mixing if effectively. So then you're kind of going to lose all your information about local depletion if you're using an areas as fleets approach. So that's, that's probably a downside of that method. Yeah, so that's kind of the one of the fundamental questions is, is the reason for the differences in length frequencies among areas or the growth between among areas um, due to isolation and so you can model them separately or is it something else um, so that you can't do that and therefore you you have this issue of having to do a spatial model with movement and everything in it because then when you get movement and there's different length uh, growth in different areas in the the modeling starts to become more difficult right so then like Nicholas's presentation that's online talking about using size structures models instead, or do you go to a size age model, which is even more difficult to, to model and parameterize. Yeah, Carolina. I was wondering if we could use the, the spatial temporal models we use for uh, abundance estimate to sort of weight the the um, growth functions and then input and like an average weighted by the abundance growth for the model just to transform the catches kind of in a, an average way that is more representative or do that for the weight by the catches i don't know something like that yeah, so I think that's kind of a combination of what Nicola was talking about and what um, Phil was talking about with the abalones. Yeah, so um, Matt, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I was going to follow up on your comment about the spatially or like having different um, growth curves. Uh, what we've done is we it, it hasn't been spatially explicit, but in the U.S. Uh, Southeast Atlantic, uh, we've 
often had different uh, length or growth curves that are associated with a specific fishery. And so we estimate this external to the model and then fix it and then have a separate population growth curve. And this allows us to extract the fish at the right age. Uh, we haven't tried estimating it within the model, um, but all my experience with trying to estimate um, growth curves from length distributions hasn't been very good. And it's been very dependent on the starting values that you use. And it doesn't always converge to the same place. And I guess I'm thinking of the big eye example that I uh, worked with. Um, and the other thing that we found with that example is that you have to be careful with your uh, weight frequency as well, because if you're, you should do convert your weight frequency to your length frequency outside the model and make sure that they match up between the two. Um, Cause otherwise your weight frequency can actually influence your growth estimates quite, uh, quite a lot. And if your conversion factors are off, it can uh, result in an L infinity that's very large beyond what you would expect given your length frequency. Um, and then some other comments that I had um, was, oh, uh, there was one that we talked about that the, the L infinity could be overweighted by the small fish. And so one methodology to get around that is to weight your samples by age. And so that each age class is given um, a, a weight of one. And so then that'll allow you to be able to better estimate your L infinity and not be as influenced by your um, small samples in the K. Um, and I think, oh, and then I had another question that this might lead to another topic, but um, in the Western Pacific Ocean, we've looked at um, trying to integrate the tags with the otoliths. And I think it was Yellowfin where we found that a lot of the tag data seem to be larger sizes than those from the otoliths. And I think we looked at it spatially and couldn't find any differences. And I guess we still, we didn't really figure out a good hypothesis for what the difference is, but I guess thinking about Kai's talk and it could potentially be due to a plasticity. I don't know if we've looked at the temporal aspect of that at all, but I'm curious if anyone else has experienced that where your tagging data don't match up with the otolith data. Yeah, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Just a clarification or maybe a comment. So with your different growth parameters for each fishery. I presume that just means you're using age length keys collected by that fishery. And does that mean that the people think that growth differs by fishery or is they trying to take into consideration the length based selectivity? Um, I think it's a combination of the two, but probably the length based selectivity, given that there's a lot of size limits um, imposed in our region. Um, and so I think that might be yeah, one way to account for it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lisa, you have a comment or question? Yes, um, just to, to Matt's thought on, on getting uh, a better, uh, more accurate um, estimate of L infinity by weighing all the age classes to the same weight. The only issue is then how do we get uncertainty and how do we get our variance? Because obviously um, we need to show that we don't have a lot of large samples. So I wonder if we should decouple it anyway and uh, get the mean growth by something like that, some, some weighing, equal weighing, and then try to get a variability separately um, just so we're not fooling ourselves um, that we're really precise on that L infinity. But, um, the, my next comment. So, Lisa, to, sorry, to, just yes. to clarify, you meaning variation of length at age rather than yes. uncertainty? Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Um, and then Matt's coming on, comment on tag data and OLIFs. Um, are you saying that you're comparing them separately or, you, or when you integrate them together, they are different? Um, because I know that. Um, I mean, there, there's not some, some models that are able to integrate tagging data by making the, the age um, a tagging, uh, you know, an unknown, a random effect. And it seems to deal with this um, 
disconnect between OLIS, you know, this age-based OLIS, and then the tagging data, which is a a growth increment. Yeah, yeah. So we we are doing that. Um, well, Paige was Paige did that. Um, but I think what we found was that all of the lengths of the tags at recapture were larger in almost all regards compared to okay. any of the lengths in the ODLS. But yeah, it, it also the lengths at age seem to be larger as well in some cases, but you, you would see more large, or you would just see large tagged fish, but you wouldn't see those large fish in the otolith samples. Sure. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Dan. Um, just quick for Lisa. Um, that L1 parameter problem you kind of briefly mentioned in your presentation, we kind of come across that in our Yellowfin assessment review that some issues that reviewers picked up. Um, I, yeah, that kind of caused us some grievances in motor fitting, et cetera. But in general, if you have um, good age, size and age data, I think you can estimate that outside your model, right? But for a lot of our growth curve was estimated using tagging data. So you don't have a good anchor on the, you know, those the L1 parameter. I just wonder if you have any experience in terms of, you know, in this kind of situation, how you deal with that. Do you kind of try to let the model estimate it or you kind of try to get it from other sources? Or... Yeah, so my experience with it is actually not with tunas, it's with um, groupers, but um, that's exactly what we did is we looked for other sources of data that were not, you know, maybe they were fishery independent and they were not they were not, you know, part of the, the assessment model, but at least they said something about that, that L1 and where it should be, um, and then fix it based on that, um, and then also fix the, the, the variance, um, the CV, um, based on that external observation. Now, if you don't have any data at all, uh, you can do that. I would just say uh, that you should do sensitivity runs because um, a slight change of that L1 might change uh, the scaling of your population and might change um, even some, some other dynamics given if, if it's linked to, to natural mortality, right? So I, I think my advice would be do sensitivity runs around maybe a couple of different values just to make sure that it's not driving your assessment. You think it's not a good idea to estimate it within the assessment? Or is that something that um, you, you can, but then it's going to be very influenced by your selectivity um, around those because, right? Because, it, well, I'm thinking about the context of SS where those, any age data you put in um, is affected by the selectivity of the fleet that we associated the data with. And um, there's some pretty major truncations happening in, in younger ages. Um, and at least for grouper, where there's a size limit, it's, it's, it's a real, there's some big assumptions that SS is, is, is making about those, those size limits and what we're observing based on the selectivities. So I would just say be, be, weir be wary of, of how important your selectivity is influencing your, L your L1 as well. Okay, so related to that, so when you fit a growth curve outside the model, um, it tends to be biased based on that selective length based selectivity, right? But there's also length based sampling that people usually do because they want to get a range of um, sizes so that they can get their growth curve. Um, does that is is the biases in that? enough to say that you really should never use a, mo um, a growth curve estimated outside the model? Yeah. Um, or, or is there cases where it's reasonable to do that and, and use the fixed parameters inside the model? Yeah, Lisa? Yeah, again, I think if, you know, if there's something like a size limit in place, then then I would raise a red flag and, and, and really try to, 
even if you're going to estimate the growth curve externally, it's fine, but but find a way to make it with truncated truncated distributions. Um, because in that case, yes, you can go you can be quite biased in the younger ages. Um, if if there's not strong selection, might might not be as much as a problem. And then your question about random at age versus random at size sampling, um, I, I asked myself that question too, but on a broader sense, because obviously we know SS can accommodate um, conditional age at length. And uh, at least in what I've seen in ICAD is uh, as soon as we get data, we tend to, to put it in there as conditional age at length. But when you start to ask how they were collected, it's not clear to me that they're necessarily uh, random at size. Um, and in a lot of times they're opportunistic samples. And so they're, they're not anything. And, and actually they're probably not very representative. Um, and I, I actually worry about, um, assume, you know, making that assumption that we can, we can treat them as random at size when if lack of representation, lack of representation can, can introduce bias. So should we be careful about low sample sizes and conditional agent length. Yeah, Rich. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, taking on from your and Lisa's point, I mean, you can do conditional agent length outside of an assessment. You just need to jointly model the size distribution of the fish that have been aged with the age given length distribution of the fish that have been aged. You can deal with that outside the model. It, that's there's no impediment to doing that. It's just easier if you can assign those fish that have been aged to a given fishery inside the model where it takes selectivity. But Lisa's point is right: is that if they're opportunistic samples, then that selectivity of the fish from a fishery that you're assigning those age samples to is not actually what the size distribution lines up with. You're kind of biasing the prior age distribution in those fish, so it's not necessarily dealing with the selectivity in the right way. Sometimes in the in an integrated model, you should assign those fish that have been aged to their own little mini fishery where they have the size distribution of what actually was aged. You estimate a selectivity for that, and that should deal with it because sometimes there's a mismatch there. Just kind of following on that up so we can understand it better. If you have age condition on length, it's really the age processes that you have to mess up to mess it up, right? I'm, I think, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you if you consider what you have to do outside of the integrated assessment is you have to come up with a prior age distribution by year for the fish that have been aged. So it's nice in the integrated model because it does it for you with this, all of that. But there's other ways to do it outside of a model. But you do have to do it to deal with the fact that you've probably got a bias in the ages in the sample because of size selectivity. Um, so it's just making sure that you're basing that prior age distribution on the fish that were aged, not necessarily what you'd think the fish from a given fisheries prior age would be. Because if they don't, if those two size distributions don't match up, they'd be different. Okay. Any other topics? Okay. I, I guess. I'll bring up a topic we haven't covered yet is how do you model temporal variability in growth in the stock assessment? Um, you know, does the whole growth curve change over time? Does K change over time? Does L infinity change over time? And when you model it, you probably shouldn't automatically change all the fish to move to grow like the, or to be the a the length that the um, new growth curve looks like you should model the growth increments so you don't have big increases or decreases in, in size so does anyone have any experience with modeling temporal variability in the growth curve in a stock assessment and or even outside a stock assessment and and how they did that Yeah, Kai. Yeah, I just want to say absolutely. I think you should model the cohort, so you should not uh, just shift the 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 mean of the just the whole curve, but it, you should be 
basically tracking tracking the cohorts because a lot when when you look at at, at growth patterns, I mean they <laughs> when they change over time, you see that signal of change in, in in the cohorts, and I think you you really get it wrong if you if you just shift the growth curves. Yeah. So related to that is is spatial differences in growth or temporal dif well, I guess not temporal, but spatial differences in growth. Is that genetic or environmental? Temporal changes in growth. Oh, spatial. Yeah, I moved to spatial. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, it's it's quite hard to know, right? Um, but mostly, I would expect. I mean, if you if you have fish move and they're they're you know not not very fast so that basically you um you know if you have very high movement rates yeah you shouldn't see see those differences but i think even at sort of intermediate movements rate movement rates you you might see them and i think lisa described um you know the um that observation that fish might go to some place where the growth is really, you know, feeding is really good. They grow really fast and they go somewhere else and they will, you know, carry that signal with them, right? They will always be fairly large, even though they may no longer be growing as, as, as fast. And I, I, I would very much generally think that, that there's a strong effect of, of plasticity um there might be a, a genetic uh, component too if you have stocks that are relatively low in mixing and i think someone else alluded to that so there's this sort of genetic population structure that you only with you know looking at uh, mutual markers and stuff that you only pick up if the mixing rates are extremely low but you can find differences in um sort of quantitative traits at at higher mixing rates and and you have to remember that the the plasticity itself itself is also a, a genetic uh trait right so the the plasticity the degree of plasticity and the reaction norms are also um you know selected for so i, I think I, I don't think there's a very simple answer to that question is the okay simple yeah answer. Um, Rich, yeah, I think it was yeah. Just to agree with what Kai said, it's going to be case dependent. Like if it, if it really is genetic. So with SBT, they've shown that grow faster but slightly smaller trend over a sort of 30, 40 years. Um, but we don't know why. And if it's if it was genetic, then you should be modeling the cohort because it's a sort of time shift in the effective growth rate of each cohort getting progressively different over time. But if it's density dependence and a food effect, it, it is happening. In one instance. They have a different growth increment than the other if or over time and then it's not a cohort specific thing it is a time thing and i think we've just fudged it by having it morph <laughs> decadally over time to try and fit it it's not the right way to do it uh but it wasn't clear which one it is because we just don't know which which hypothesis is true and i think until you know why it's happening it's hard to deal with the how to to model it but you do have to i think but how okay yeah, Aaron. Yeah, thanks. I just, <clears throat> with the fear of being run out of here by you all, um, given uncertainties we have with you know all sorts of things with tuna population dynamics, you know, movement, recruitment, selectivity, all those types of things, and our data improving, we're still a long ways to go. But at what point would we consider using? empirical input estimates for growth like empirical length at age weighted age um, i understand that you probably have to do simulations to show potential biases uncertainties within the scope of some of those other unknowns um, but i do know it works for other species um, in more data rich situations um, so very curious on folks thoughts so do you mean estimating the age outside the model from the length frequencies or do you mean putting in a, like a empirical mean length 
at age in the into the stock assessment? The the latter by year or area or what have what have you. But you would you'd still be fitting to the length frequency data in the model. No comments on that, but I would say why would you do that if you had that much age length data? Why wouldn't you just convert the the the, the length frequencies into age and use catch it age instead? Yeah, I I, I think, you know, again it, it speaks to some of the stuff Lisa said about, you know, selectivity and also just as we try to include spatial temporal variation in all sorts of parameters, there's eventually this crossroads or trade-off that we have to consider. So yeah. I mean, I, I think my, in my opinion, it might be the related to the spatial temporal scale of the data and how you want to do it, right? It's the same with our spatial models, right? We don't do a fine scale spatial temporal model, stock assessment model, because it's just too computationally intensive. So we what we spatially temporally standardize the CPUE outside the model because that's the one we can do. Now it looks like we're going to do spatial temporal modeling of tagging data outside the model because again at the small scale mixing rates important. So maybe the length frequency or the growth or the converting to age might need to be done outside the model because of um, you know fine spatial temporal scale of that data. So until we get a really good model or efficient way of doing the spatial temporal model, population dynamics models, maybe all of that's going to be done outside the model instead of inside the model. Don't know. Okay, on that, we should um, move on to the next topic, I think. I think it's got it right, 11 o'clock, yeah. So that we're moving on to um, identifying stock structure, and Carolina and Brad are going to give a joint um, presentation to status off as the keynote. Just going to fill in time here. Um, what? So before we change topics, uh, I'm just going to comment that in 2014 we did a paper with uh, Jim Thornton looking at the variability of um, weighted age uh, meta-analysis, and it, it, the year effect was one that was could explain uh, a about half the variation in, in most of the, the stocks we, we looked. So that might be an interesting paper to look, if you guys want. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we are giving a talk on good practice in identifying tuna stock structure. Um, just before we start, I'd like to thank Carolina for the opportunity to collaborate with her on this talk. Um, it's been a, a good experience so far and a, and a good opportunity um, to revisit some of the discussions that we've had um, over the past few years. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brad Moore. I'm a uh, fish biologist, fishery scientist here at Niwa, um, based in Nelson in the South Island, struggling a little bit with the jet lag from my 25 minute flight five days ago. Um, so stock structure of tuners we've had a lot of talk over the last couple of days um, about um, evidence for spatial structuring in tuna populations um, historically uh, tuners were um, considered to show very little st structuring um, if you look at them set if you look at the animals themselves they're sleek they're fast they're highly mobile um, they were considered to live in a in a relatively borderless uh, uh, environment at the open ocean if you look at patterns in catch data, for example, um, they exhibit relatively continuous uh, distributions, albeit with uh, differing densities. They have large spawning areas, um, particularly tropical tuners, for example, um, appear to spawn 
uh, relatively continuously where the water is over 24 degrees um, and we've heard um, previous discussions around the um, optimum water temperature for skipjack being in that 28 to 29 degree area of the western pacific warm pool in the pacific for example and early molecular studies um, allozymes and isozyme techniques um, showed little evidence of more than one population um, in each ocean basin that's more to do with the, the this resolution of the tools themselves um, than anything with the biology. Because of these, um, sorry, not because of these, um, management and, and assessments of uh, tuna in each of the ocean basins are generally assumed to have one uh, population, um, two in the in the Pacific, obviously, Western and Eastern populations. Um, these arrangements were really set up. Um, around the historical development of fisheries management in the oceans rather than due to any biological considerations. We now know um, from recent and not so recent evidence that there's uh, quite a lot of spatial structuring in tuna um, across all oceans. We've got newer genetic tools, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that have shown evidence uh, for more than one reproductive um, group of yellowfin, for example, in the Pacific Ocean from work by Peter Grew and others. Um, also separation of Eastern and Western um, yellowfin in the Atlantic and separation or confirmation of separation of isolation between albacore in the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean. If we look at tagging data, um, particularly for tropical tuners, um, where there's a lot of information available that generally suggests a degree of regional fidelity and there's a number, other, a number of other biological, biochemical, fishery, um, and other lines of evidence. So I'll be talking about some of the basic uh, good practices for identifying tuna stock structure, and then I'll hand over to Carolina, who's going to give us a good example for yellowfin tuna. So a key challenge for uh, identifying stock structure in tunas is to distangle all these spatial dynamics that we've been talking about uh, within a stock from stock differences. Are they differences within, um, within a stock or do we have multiple stocks in our, in our population? And it's probably worth just pausing there to reflect on what a stock might be. Generally or historically, a stock was considered to be a unit of, of management interest to a fishery. Um, and so this definition rose, uh, gave rise to um, a lot of different terms around stocks stock structure. So for example, you could have parasitological stocks, that is a stock of fish with separate parasites to a neighboring stock of fish, for example. Um, when it comes to tuna stock structure, um, fisheries managers, managers are generally concerned with the question of will fishing in this area here affect fishing in, in this jurisdiction over here? Um, that is, there's some degree of independence, whether that's uh, demographic independence, genetic independence um, that's really up to the management decisions um, but a degree of independence is what we define for stocks and when we're identifying stock structure we're looking at essentially two separate but connected pro uh, problems or puzzles the first is stock identification how many stocks are we looking at and the second is stock discrimination so what individual does this particular fish what, what stock does it uh, come from? And this latter point is particularly uh, important for things like our bluefin tuners, um, particularly Pacific and Atlantic bluefin, where you've got mixing on the high seas, but relatively separate spawning areas. So we had a reflection um, over the last few months, um, and we've come up with four good practice considerations um, for identifying uh, tuna stock structure. And I should point out that these good practice considerations are not unique to tuna, um, but they could be applied um, to stock structure studies in general. The first is to gain an understanding of your system. Ideally, develop a conceptual model or alternative plausible hypotheses um, that incorporate current understanding, identify your key areas of uncertainty, from which you can base your clear and testable research questions and hypotheses that if you need to go out and do some sampling, you've got something to, to, to plan around. 
The second is to implement studies that are interdisciplinary. They use multiple techniques. The third is to make sure that you're sampling with an appropriately designed and because we're dealing with animals that live across open oceans, a coordinated sampling program that links back to your testable hypotheses. And the fourth is really linked to the third. It's just about following through, phasing your, your sampling and replicating your sampling. And I'll talk about each of these more in detail. So for the first one, developing conceptual models, your testable hypotheses um, and your well-defined research questions, we can look at basic models or general models, should I say, from population ecology. Some of these were presented, or these were presented at the CAPAM meeting in Rome last year, um, and they've since been published um, in fisheries research by Steve, Dan, uh, Aaron, uh, and others. These are general models. They can start just help us to think about the picture of stock structure that we might have for our species. But it's important to know that not all species are created equal, um, but there are some taxonomic consistencies, obviously. To add on to these generalized models, um, this could be informed by expert opinion. So gaining an, an understanding of what's happened previously in stock structure research for the species that you're looking at. Um, so an example of, of gaining expert opinion, um, there was a workshop held at SBC New Mere in 2018 um, that tackled this problem of identifying spatial stock structure of, of tropical uh, Pacific tuna stocks, focusing primarily on skipjack, yellowfin, big eye and albacore. It was funded by Conservation International um, through uh, the UN FAO um, Common, Asia, Common Oceans ABNJ project. That workshop was informed by a review document. So a few of us went away, put together a review of everything that we know about stock structure of the four species that we were looking at. And that review, in turn, should be informed by in addition to understanding of what's happened in the past with stock structure studies, but an understanding of the fishery dynamics, the species biology, their habitat requirements, um, and the dynamics of that, that habitat. So temperature preferences, for example, um, biogeographical or biogeochemical provinces and how they uh, drive tuna movement and structuring. Presence of seamounts and other oceanograph oceanographic features, um, and then, of course, um, features such as uh, ENSO, salinity fronts, currents, upwellings. Simulation will be important here, developing a conceptual model, applying it into your stock assessment, seeing how the, what the result is on your assessment, and then reevaluate when new information is available. Our second good practice consideration is to implement studies that are interdisciplinary. There's been a range of techniques applied to tuna and other species to identify stocks from genetic or genomic markers, uh, environmental tags such as odolith chemistry or parasites, artificial tags, we had a good discussion on that on day one. Um, they could be conventional tags, dart tags for example, or more sophisticated electronic archival tags. Looking at the species biology, I've just had some good discussions on that. Um, also their morphometrics and meristics. And then, of course, looking at uh, other sources of information, such as what you get out of the fishery or fisheries independent surveys, so larval surveys, for example. Each of these te techniques has its advantages and limitations, and that's why we consider interdisciplinary studies to be best practice. Um, they allow for each of um, the assumptions of each technique can be smoothed over other techniques. It maximizes uh, the likelihood of detecting stocks and it helps to resolve some of those questions around spatial dynamics and separating those from underlying stock structure. Generally, best practice in the literature is to apply one genetic or genomic technique, um, SNPs now being the gold standard in this approach, and one other approach, so otolith chemistry, for example. The third best practice consideration or good practice consideration um, comes into design and then implementation. Um, now there's really a lot of information on this slide and I could give a presentation on each of these points separately, um, but I'm gonna gloss over it a little bit here just so we've got time for Carolina. Um, but we've talked about this over the last couple of days as well. 
you don't just rush out sample without a plan. It's, it's best to design, design, design. And what you want to map out here is the who. Who are you sampling? What sort of life history stages are going to give you the information for the questions that you've developed? What, when, where, and how? Because we're dealing with um, species that live in uh, oceanic environments, international collaboration is key here. Um, but as John said the other day, uh, design really important, but it's the, really the easy part and implementation is the hard part. How do we get these sampling strategies and protocols out into that environment? And there's lots of considerations that we need around sampling strategies and protocols. That's protocols for obtaining fish, for example, species identification, particularly of juveniles, such as yellowfin and big eye that can be misidentified, um, sample collection approaches, and uh, the need to avoid cross-contamination, particularly for genetic material, sample la labeling, preserving and packaging. How are you gonna get the samples from your collection point to um, either a storage facility or directly to the lab facilities? Um, and that includes permitting as well and metadata collection and storage. And that's just on collecting the samples. Then we've got all the analyses that come with that and the data handling processes to follow. On the right there is just a bit of a map that we put together from that workshop. Um, and there's a paper that resulted from that um, that really focused on sampling considerations and future directions for identifying um, tuna stock structure for our Pacific species. And my last point here is just um, that sampling should be phased, ideally, and replicated in time and space. So we've spoken about this with tagging data as well. Um, but for any stock structure study, ideally it should be balanced. So with tags, for example, we've got most of our tags going into areas where we've got high abundance of fish um, or where we've got sampling opportunities such as the pole and line fishery in the Pacific. Um, and this is because these studies aren't simply only designed for stock structure, but they're, they're designed to collect a whole bunch of information um, for use in assessments. So balancing the study is important. Phasing. So phasing can help stretch budgets and iron out any kinks in your sampling program. So for as an example of phasing, um, I've borrowed these maps from Peter Grew here. So his study was published in 2015. He had samples from the Coral Sea, Tokelau, and off the coast of Baja. Three locations. So the next phase, hypothetical phase, would be to follow that up, sample those locations again, but then start adding in some more, more information, more locations where you see uh, differences. So for example, the differences between Tokelo and Baja, throw in a site at Hawaii, for example, and just start populating that as you go. And then temporarily repeat that sampling. That'll allow you to assist the persistence of spatial patterns and the, and the presence of dynamic um, stock boundaries. And this is particularly important in a changing world. We know that um, patterns in ENSO, for example, can have a, a, a large effect on the distribution of um, skipjack and yellowfin, at least, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, with El Nino conditions moving fish uh, to the east um, in response to the movement of the Western Pacific warm pool. So what effect does that have on stock structure, for example? Does it just compress everything? Does it allow for a corridor of fish to move across to the Eastern Pacific? We don't know. Um, that's why it's important to have sampling set up um, to answer some of those questions. And with that, I'll hand over to Carolina. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. And thank you for teaming up with me in this important topic. So I'm going to um, exemplify um, why we sh cannot uh, avoid the discussion of, of a sock structure or a spatial structure uh, in, when we do assessment of, of uh, tuna stocks. And I'm going to talk about the example of the yellowfin tuna stock. And this is a work we are doing with um, all our staff in the ITTC. Uh, it's managed by the ITTC, and we assume one population in the jurisdiction of um, the commission, which is the area highlighted here in the Pacific. Uh, this stock uh, is mostly fish with um, per seine fisheries, 96% of the catch. And 
there's three different types of sets. One of them is a set around dolphins, which is um, where we find one of the largest uh, uh, fishes in the, in the fishery. And traditionally, that fishery was the one that produced the secondary indices of abundance we used to use in our assessment. And then we have a long line catch, uh, which although is only 4% of the catches, this fishery is important because it provides the, uh, used to provide the main index of abundance for uh, yellowfin tuna. Okay, in our 2019 assessment, uh, we had to reject that assessment because we found out like the um, stock structures results was highly sensitive just to the inclusion of the last quarter of data for the long line index of abundance. And we have found the same problem with the big eye assessment the year before. We tried, um, that highlighted and um, the data conflicts we, we had among the, um, our indices and um, really made us not, not ignore anymore the model misspecification that was screaming uh, at us. We try many things uh, as good modelers. We try to fix it with uh, different assumptions. Okay, let's run it differently. It didn't work. Uh, we only uh, were missing, um, uh, we didn't try spatial structure at that, um, at that moment. Uh, neither uh, the um, hypothesis of multiple stocks. But so for the 2020 assessment, we continue um, doing research. And one of the things we did is use the best possible um, models for CPUE standardization to see if that was uh, one of the problems we had uh, that caused the, the, um, the, um, the data conflict between the indices. But the data conflict persisted. Um, uh, and the interesting thing is because the indices were um, standardized using also the length frequencies, we were able to uh, track the cohorts. So in, if, if you, we had just one population uh, well mixed, if we had a strong cohort coming in, we will see it first in the person index because uh, catches slightly smaller and younger fish than in the long line index. But we don't see that. What we see in fact is, uh, uh, for example, in this uh, 2000 year, we have a peak in the long line index before uh, a peak in the uh, person index. But looking at the length frequencies and tracking the cohorts, we uh, discover that those are indeed two strong cohorts. They are different cohorts and the um, long line index was mostly associated with uh, El Nino conditions and the person index was mostly associated with the 99 cohort of a strong La Nina conditions. Okay, so we further looked into, okay, what are the, um, uh, the spatial domains for these two indices and for this, uh, for the 2020 assessment, uh, you could see here, uh, this was not in purpose, but uh, due to the um, uh, how we selected the data and, and uh, where, where the fishery is more um, active, those are the spatial domains for the two indices. So they are completely uh, separated. And what we see is um, the long line index is mostly associated with conditions sort of toward the central and, and west of the EPO and the porcine uh, more towards uh, the north and the, and the uh, east. And if we see, um, if we look at what happened uh, in the 98 and 99 years, El Nino and La Nina conditions, we see that um, uh, the conditions towards the west and central are uh, uh, associated with the warm pool. And this is when the, uh, there was an expansion of these province of this biogeochemical pro province uh, towards the eastern Pacific and almost to the, towards the coast. And this is when the good, uh, the strong um, cohort was showed up in the long line. And then uh, for La Nina, we had the opposite. We had the contraction of the warm pool and then the expansion of these two other uh, provinces, which um, are mostly associated with the porcine. So if we hypothesize the, the recruitment success of uh, tuna is most likely uh, related to habitat availability, then we will have an explanation for these two strong cohorts. Uh, 
So that got us thinking, and then we start uh, collecting, okay, let's see if we have more evidence uh, of two different groups of fish in the EPO. So we start piling up the information from different sources, interdisciplinary st studies. So for example, in this, in this, um, in this uh, um, slide, I'm putting all the genomic and genetic uh, studies and uh, we could see the the letters uh, indicate the name of the the first name of the author we could see that whenever the authors look at the eastern side and the western side they found differences and when they only look at the coastal like coast of the america like muñoz for example uh, there was no differences so that uh, is consistent with two groups of, of fish and uh, we then look at other information, for example, larval distribution. We see different dynamics in the two, in the two areas. Um, uh, reproductive biology, we see differences in the, in the uh, eastern and the, and the western side. Uh, trophic position, we see this intrusion of different uh, uh, night, no, composition of a stable isotopes, probably different preys and feeding conditions in this area compared to the, um, to the more eastern area. Uh, tagging data, we can see from archival tags, the fish that go, uh, they are associated with the more the eastern part, they sort of are, um, uh, uh, they stay locally, whereas the, um, the tags, uh, the archival tags with the sort of the Western part, they also stay locally. Uh, this is uh, tagging data from the, um, from the Western Central Pacific. We see fish tagged in the central area, in the green area. They, over time, they tend to spread out, move uh, in, in both directions. Whereas fish tag in the red area, they tend to stay in that area. So it seems to be showing that there is some movement uh, involved with, with this central fish here. So uh, we improved then our ideas about how the stock work or the in, in the EPO. And now what we how we updated our conceptual models, we might have two groups of fish, at least two, and uh, one more associated with the conditions in the central area, maybe the warm pool. Um, and a fisher will move in and out, and we will see this signal more in the long line in this due to the the um, the uh, special domain of that index. And then we will have a, another group that is more uh, towards the eastern part and have more regional fidelity and mostly associated with the person index. Okay, uh, that's fine, but now how do we split the catches and try to assess those two groups? That was the big question we had in the 2020 uh, benchmark assessment. But for now, uh, so we continue the research and we, since we start thinking, okay, maybe this, those two groups of fish are associated with these two ecosystems, these two different water masses. If so, maybe we can use some oceanographic variables as proxy for the characteristic of these water masses. And this is what I did here. I just summarized some oceanography uh, variables using principal component analysis. The, the first component is playing uh, as almost 70% of the variation. And you can see here, this is the, um, just uh, showing the gradient of this principal component from the east to the west and how it's, uh, how it's distributed uh, by, by year and quarter. Uh, okay, that is showing, showing me some gradients and maybe some split, but where would I actually split these two groups? So looking at the figures, we decided a minus one, but then uh, we did some further analysis with the three, three analysis with length frequency data and the split at uh, minus 1.05 was supported by the length frequency. So looking at these two areas, these two groups, um, split at that uh, condition, what we can see here is uh, the boundary between these groups might be dynamic. Uh, some years you might have more intrusions of one group and some other years more intrusions of another group. So it's something that we might have to take into account as well. 
So finally, uh, uh, the 2020 assessment, we did a, um, a risk analysis framework. And for practical reasons, we had uh, we model mostly the high mix in hypothesis of the hypothesis that could explain um, our um, what we were seeing in our data, but with an emphasis of the 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 most of the where most of the catches came from. Uh, so driving these models with the percent index of abundance. Which, but then uh, we continue the research to be able to um, uh, model this other uh, hypothesis for the for the um, dynamic of the stock. So these two groups, they might be mixing uh, episodically or they might not be mixing. But now that we know, like um, we have an idea or a, a hypothesis how these two groups might be associated with the ecosystem, we perhaps could then split the catches and then uh, try some try to model this dynamic either with spatial models or or true one area model depending on the hypothesis so that's the idea for the next uh, um, assessment so in summary this example showed how we had a um, hypothesis we pile up on the interdisciplinary studies hopefully this um, this knowledge can be used to design new studies and to maintain it over time as um, the proposal that we are putting for, forward with uh, Brad. And this will allow us to produce better assessment and management strategy evaluation, so operating models for MSCs and give better scientific advice. The conceptual models and the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies, they need to be done uh, taking into account a broad, um, a wide uh, levels of expertise, experts in different fields. Uh, here is where the biologists can help us a lot, and the stakeholders. Also, important to do auxiliary analysis and open your mind for these uh, dynamic um, boundaries, for example. And that will uh, allow us to pro produce uh, better scientific uh, advice. Before I end, um, I was asked to give a little bit of a, a advertisement for the World Fisheries Congress. Uh, uh, Claudio Castillo, who is here, is uh, organizing this, um, this workshop, so please come. And uh, we would like to thank uh, our colleagues for discussion, the co-authors of the Yellowfin Tunis uh, stock, Steve, for valuable discussions, and SPC for the tagging data, funding uh, from NIWA, ITTC, and ISSF. With that, i leave you with some questions. And the main question we want to ask you, how often do you revisit stock structure information before conducting an assessment? It's only when you cannot ignore it anymore like we, uh, we did, <laughs> or how often do you do? Thank you. Thanks, Carolina and Brad. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, Jim Marie. On that last question, on the last question, Carolina, I just wonder how often is too often to revisit the stock structure? Sorry, can you repeat? How often is too often? Can you revisit stock structure too often? Or? Well, uh, my personal view is every time you're going to do an assessment, let's review everything we have. Uh, but also we, we do, at least at ITTC and SPC, we do have uh, scientific capability to, um, to go there and do sampling of quantities and variables that might be uh, useful to detect stock structure. So if we as a group have a, a shared conceptual model, right? Uh, the, the, the design of this sampling uh, can be very uh, informative. Uh, the data that comes from that design very very informative for uh, the assessment and and the uh, evaluation of the stock structure. Th thanks, Carolina. And just to follow up on that, um, a comment's been made earlier um, at this meeting that tuna scientists don't publish enough. So your review of stock structure information shouldn't be just a grab the paragraph in the assessment report, do a lit review and, and add on a couple of sentences. Um, it should be yeah, talking to the geneticists, um, the people doing, doing that work, um, because yeah, a lot of it's not in the literature. 
And I guess uh, uh, we might be afraid, okay, if we revise, we might have to have way more complicated models. And sometimes it's not the case. Like for example, South, South uh, uh, Swordfish, South EPO Swordfish, uh, we had three hypotheses of stock structure uh, that were put forward by the stak stakeholders. And the only thing we had to do is increase the, the um, it was stock boundaries. So increase the boundary or decrease the boundary. And that was enough to at least account for that uncertainty. So something to think about. Yeah, pro probably every time you do a benchmark, you should actually reevaluate your conceptual model. You don't have to probably evaluate every single thing, but at least look at your conceptual model, see what data and information is new, and then see how that influences that and update it. As it, currently, when we do benchmark assessments, we, we think about the stock assessment model, but we've typically assume that the stock structure is known. And most stock assessment people are like that. We, that's a given, it's too hard. <laughs> Whatever it is, we're gonna stick with it. Um, the other thing is the um, management boundaries, right? I mean, we're, we've got 150 as our boundary and that's the boundary of our stock, but that doesn't mean much to the stock itself. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Laura. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Brad and Carolina, for a great presentation. Um, I wanted to go back to the question of stock definition, and specifically from a fisheries perspective, what is the minimum level of exchange between two putative stocks, and over what time period that would make us consider them as a single stock for fisheries management? And the reason why we're especially interested in this at this moment is that we run into this issue with in Australia with the stock definition for broadbill swordfish, where tagging tells us that they mostly move along a north-south axis from Australia and don't really go beyond New Zealand. But if you look at the genetic information, uh, we're seeing that even using quite sophisticated genetic markers, there's not there's no stock, um, there's no different stocks uh, from at least Australia all the way to Cook Islands. And so I was wondering if there's been any experience in the room with dealing with um, these more practical definitions of, of what should be a stock for the purpose of local management. I'll, I'll have first go at that and Carolina can add on anything that I might have missed. Um, I think, first of all, it comes down to, to defining your problem initially um, and, and how you're going to define that stock. Do you, do you want your stock to be a genetic unit or do you want it to be more of a, a group of fish with um, a demographic um, independence? Um, from our review of the literature and preparation for this work, it, it seems that stock definitions are heading more towards that demographic independence route rather than being purely um, genetic um, units. Um, yeah, so that, that's why we proposed here that um, you would sort of think about it in the context of does fishing here affect fishing over there? Um, I think it was Matt Vincent earlier today who said that genetics can be quite sensitive to movement um, of a few individuals. So is a few individuals enough um, that it might cause genetic, genetic homogeneity, um, but you've essentially got demographically isolated populations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and uh, my current thinking is we have to be really honest with ourselves with when we build the concept of models. Like for example, swordfish, there might be even one whole stock in the, in the Pacific for, for what the geneticists are telling us. Because in the Central Pacific, where they go to spawn, they basically are a mix. Uh, so that is one of the um, hypotheses might be out there, maybe not a highly high probability, but we, sh we should have it into, in, in mind because sometimes we might see signals in our data that are very strange and might be like in the case of the yellowfin, explained by this 
different group of fish moving in and out. Now, the management uh, issue is a little bit more complicated and not inside uh, what I was um, will always think about, but at least if we can provide the managers different um, scenarios of what happened if that is true, uh, that might be useful. In the case, for example, of the swordfish, uh, what we did, we did scenarios of different stock boundaries, and they basically were not as influential as different scenarios about the index of abundance. So at least they were considered and they gave a peace of mind for, for the um, results, right? Any other okay. comments? Thank, yeah. Thanks, Caroline. I think we should move on to um, Steve's uh, comment and then we can get back to any more questions on this um, mm -hmm. in the discussion period. Thanks. So Steve, can you share your screen? I need to have the uh, Carolina stop sharing. There we go. Uh, I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, and it's in full screen and we can hear you clearly. So uh, uh, that perfect. is playing the recording for some reason. And I'm going to stop okay. that. Uh, let's try that again. Yeah, looks good. Are you hearing the recording? Uh, we can hear you, yeah, clearly. Okay, um, I guess I'll try to talk right over that recording if you're not hearing that. Oh, we can't um, hear so the recording. Uh, we can just hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks for uh, the invitation to be here. I, I wish I could be there in person, uh, even remotely. This has been a great workshop. Um, and I imagine it's even better in person, but also one of the best St. Patrick's Days I ever experienced was in Wellington. And so I'd like to be there this week uh, and next week. Uh, but thanks for the invitation um, to comment on Brad and Carolina's um, presentation. Uh, they're the experts on tuna stock ID. Um, so I'm really just here to give a broader perspective. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've worked mostly in the North Atlantic on stock assessment and stock identification, mostly demersal stocks, uh, but I have some experience in bluefin tuna. Um, around the same time I was uh, developing my skills in assessment and stock identification, uh, there was a debate over um, Atlantic bluefin tuna and what the population structure was, how that should be uh, represented in assessment and how it should be considered in management. One of the outcomes of that was Clay Porch's VPA toolbox. And uh, even though the VPA itself is a bit dated now, the approach of having multiple areas and allowing tuna to cross boundaries um, was revolutionary to me, kind of uh, collided my two worlds of stock assessment and stock identification. And really, uh, I think showed all of us that um, spatial dynamics are not just about drawing boundaries. Um, they're just as much about movement within areas as well. So I got involved in electronic tagging, um, otolith chemistry, spatial modeling. And despite the friendly advice from Pamela Mace, I also got involved in the ICAT assessments uh, of bluefin tuna. Um, and so I think my main message today is that the basics are the same for uh, tunas and other species um, because we're making the same model assumptions. You know, everything from invertebrates to mammals uh, and lakes to deep sea, um, for our benthic bivalves, uh, we only have dispersal at the early stages, but then we have a great deal of spatial heterogeneity, spatially structured assessments, uh, rotational management. Uh, Lake whitefish are inland, but they were one of the poster children for uh, the genetic stock concept. Uh, deep sea redfish um, recruit to different depth habitats and form reproductively isolated groups there. And orcas also have behavioral groups um, that are discrete and form uh, reproductive groups as well. And so for this range of diversity, uh, using the same interdisciplinary approach, we've learned about them and we've learned about population structure from each of them. 
um, so that we can apply those to others. Um, and so I'll, I'll start where we ended up last fall at the Kaplan workshop in Rome, is that um, repeating some of what Brad and Carolina said, is that we really should try to use uh, interdisciplinary stock identification um, to determine the most plausible population structure or multiple structures. Um, and we should really be updating that in each stock assessment report. Uh, as Mark just suggested, maybe every benchmark assessment um, should review that information again. Um, and really there is no silver bullet here. Um, the new information, for example, from genomics needs to be reconciled with traditional approaches like tagging. These days with climate change, um, we really need to test the persistence of spatial patterns. I think Carolina just showed that well. Uh, and then in each assessment, we should identify where the data gaps are and what research is recommended to fill those gaps. So there are some special aspects of tunas. Um, of course, they're highly migratory and mixing aspects, the large spatial scale. Uh, we may have larval retention areas that are entire ocean basins uh, for North Atlantic bluefin, the, the Mediterranean, the Gulf and the Slope Sea. Um, the dispersal is transoceanic for juveniles and adults. Uh, the boundaries themselves are not based on bathymetry or coastlines. They may be uh, more based on oceanographic features. Uh, and then, of course, um, the large range makes the practical considerations more multinational. Despite those differences, I, I do think that we should try to learn from each other, um, is that trying to understand population structure involves spatial distribution, geographic variation, and dispersal. And things that we've learned for demersal, shellfish, or finfish can be applied to tuna, and some of what we learned from tuna can be applied to those. Um, and so really, I hope that we can take a unified approach and learn from each other. Um, and this is where we ended up last fall when it comes to spatial uh, boundaries and structure. Uh, complying with the unit stock assumption may be the most important structural decision in our modeling. Um, the stock and strata definitions should be based on the plausible structure. This iterative approach that I think that uh, Carolina's conceptual approach and Brad's design sampling uh, assessment modeling that feeds back on more research um, for revising the conceptual model, that iterative loop really should be applied to all and even from the data limited to data rich, uh, advancing toward the optimal geographic specification. Um, Spatial uh, populations, you know, where the complexity uh, can really be a challenge for assessments. Uh, the problem is that simple models may not accurately represent these spatially complex populations. Uh, simulation testing uh, is emerging as best practice there, where we develop a more spatially complex operating model and test the performance. Uh, someone just asked about how much movement is too much. I think we really need to try to uh, specify operating models that represent the system, um, the information we have on movement to see if it really messes up um, meeting our management objectives. Um, and conditioning those models be then becomes the challenge, but hopefully Aaron figured that all out with his um, spatial experiment uh, over the weekend, and I'll look forward to those results. Um, really, I I'm probably out of time, but Mark's spreadsheet identified uh, several different tuna assessments that take a range of approaches to spatial structure from drawing boundaries to having sensitivity analyses um, with different boundaries or different spatial structure within the stock area, um, movement rates, uh, alternative models with different movement rates and tag integration, um, moving toward ensemble models um, with different spatial structure and movement assumptions uh, really seems to be the state of the art. Uh, whether it's Indian Ocean yellowfin with alternative uh, movement models, South Pacific albacore that also has an ensemble with different movement models, and then uh, closer to, to where I live, uh, Atlantic bluefin, where we have an ensemble of operating models um, that have different relative abundances of each population, uh, different mixing rates, and evaluating the performance of different management procedures in the context of that complexity. So this is, uh, these were the uh, questions that were posed. I can leave it there. Um, from my perspective, the first three clusters of questions uh, 
have been asked several times, and I think there's been several good attempts in an answering them. I think four and five are really uh, the more relevant questions we should be moving towards. So with that, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Steve. So does anyone have any questions for Steve on his presentation? Okay, no specific questions, but we can move on to any questions on stock structure, Steve's presentation, or, or Brad and for Brad and Carolina. You had some? No. So I, I've got a question. Um, if the management boundaries don't match the stock structure boundaries, what should we do? Yeah, Steve. I could take a swing at that if you'd like. Um, so I, I, I think ICES has um, developed an approach for this in which they their approach is to get the science right first. Um, you know, we don't have managers decide what our natural mortality assumption is or our you know, whether our selectivity is domed or not, even though both of those have pretty large management implications. So if uh, really our models, if our models make assumptions about a unit stock and we're applying them to the data, then we should be trying to make sure that our assumptions are met. Um, in the US, we have two national standards. The second one is use best science available. And the third one is manage stocks as a unit. So I think in the US, we're legally compelled to try to represent population structure. And ICES decided that they will get the science right and communicate that to the managers, often with iteration, um, and that there may need to be some um, packaging of the catch advice um, with the spatially structured model or with a model with different spatial units than the management units. Not everyone is happy with that or satisfied with that answer, but that's where ICES ended up. And that's what several of us in the US are trying to promote. Okay. So what if, a, what if a management boundary goes right through the middle of a stock boundary? Should we have a, 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 a stock assessment model that has two areas in it, one on each side of the boundary and model any kind of diffusion or whatever between those two areas? Or should we just say, this is, this is the information from this one stock that covers everything and you guys work it out how you wanna manage it? Yeah, I think that Andre's uh, best practice menu, uh, paper from last fall addressed that pretty well, is that if we have a management boundary in the middle of a spatial population, um, that's a really good basis for a spatial stratum is that there may be different regulations, different fleets. Um, and so because modeling fishing mortality at age is one of the heterogeneities we need to address, uh, that would be a really good justification for a spatially stratum, a larger scope assessment with a spatial stratum that represents the management unit. So that way results can also be packaged into the stock available um, in each management unit. Thanks, Steve. Any other questions on stock structure? Uh, yeah, Rich. Yeah, I think if I could think of the scenario that's going to make our jobs the hardest, it's dynamic separation by distance. And unfortunately, that looks the most likely. <laughs> and that, I think that's a real challenge because there's just so much that it throws out. You're almost certainly not going to be putting boxes around areas anymore and it'd be you'd need dynamic uh, methods to measure what the relative distribution of stocks are across space and time and then you got to figure out how to connect those things together in your reproductive side of the model so it's kind of the nightmare scenario and the one that looks most likely for the ones we're most interested in so I think it's I guess in terms of the seven stages of grief it's worth getting through to acceptance pretty quickly but I think it, it, it's pretty obvious it's going to throw up some really massive challenges if you really want to deal with it, because it's the hardest one by far. Yeah, I agree. I think the isolation by distance is difficult when our solution is only drawing lines. But 
Fortunately, Jim Thorson and others have been developing spatiotemporal uh, models that are more continuous, um, and those can be discretized. So if the models um, are relatively continuous, we can still carve out results from them in a more discrete way. So I, I don't have the answer, and maybe uh, Aaron, who's presenting next, will, will have the answer to that, but there's been a lot of development in more continuous, uh, continuously distributed spatial models. And uh, that's, that might be the solution to that challenge. So that, that sounds like a recommendation that we should be going to a spatial temporal uh, population dynamics model. Yeah, Rich. I think, I think it is, but it's, it's really only the start because you could make that case irrespective of stock structure that just makes more sense. But it, it's that last aspect of, okay, you, you can do that spatially and temporally, but you, you've then got to think of the reproductive linkage bit. That, that's what I really was struggling to get my head around because you, you, you've been seeing this coming for a while. Um, and it's how you extend those spatial temporal models to include the reproductive bit. I think that's the, re the really hard part of that because just having the spatial temporal bits comparatively easy. I mean, at least we know how to do it. It's just computationally hard, but it's that second bit that I think we need to really think about and how you measure it and try and estimate. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, well, um, John Hampton's got a question, but um, I just want to ask one thing before that is if we, if we should be moving to a spatial temporal modeling approach, is the intermediate solution to do most things outside the model using spatial temporal models, outside the stock assessment model using spatial temporal models and somehow trying to integrate those back into the stock assessment model? Is that what we should be thinking about for the medium term? Yeah. Also, not the point i think this complexity also calls for a bit more of msc right so having like operating models that might be complex and see if we can have a strategy that is robust to these complexities because uh it seems that yeah the stage of grief right uh yes we cannot ignore anymore uh some realities like we in in our case the signal was very um evident in the in in the indices even so it's like there's no ignoring anymore so maybe a case for MSCs will be thanks carolina john you have a question or a comment yeah thanks mark and um i i think the carolina and steve have, have probably covered what i was going to say in response to your question, uh, which, which I think was probably you had the Pacific in mind and that pesky 150 west boundary. Um, yeah, I, I think as we kind of evolve more towards um, the use of management procedures and, and harvest strategies in, in the way that we manage these fisheries and, um, you know, testing those with MSC, um, perhaps in the Pacific, we, we will eventually evolve towards having operating models at a basin scale um, of higher spatiotemporal resolution and um, I, I guess capable of at least representing different hypotheses about stock structure and, and have those different hypotheses represented in the suite of operating models that you use to test management procedures. And as Carolina said, you can then see what the robustness is um, of your management procedure to, to differences in, in, in the sort of states of nature that are represented by those hypotheses. So that, that would be my take on it. Okay, thanks, John. Um, any other comments on that or related topics? Any other topics? I, I got one. Um, um, I know I'm not gonna be liked too much about this, but is close kin genetics the ultimate solution to stock structure? Rich is shaking his head. <laughs> I'm going to call I, on him. I, I'll <laughs> jump in there, Mark. Uh, and actually, the... this cartoon about just asking questions was aimed at you um, because I don't think it's a silver bullet. I mean, certainly the, the genetic characters uh, and the data that are collected from close kin can be used along with others. But as Brad said, and Carolina said, you really need, you don't get a holistic view of population structure. 
you can get a very good idea of where you sampled and whether it's uh, th those fish are reproductively isolated from another group of fish where you sampled, or if there's local uh, adaptation of, of selected characters. But you really need the distributional information, um, the range and the relative uh, continuity or discontinuity. Uh, you need uh, demographics because sometimes, as Brad said, uh, the isolation that we're most interested in is demographic isolation rather than reproductive isolation. Um, and so on time, time scales of stock assessment, sometimes reproductive isolation is not the most important. So market helps and it can be used along with others. And um, But even genomics um, by themselves are, are not enough. And we need to use some of the more traditional things like tagging and, and, and mapping distribution studies, um, parasites um, to complement with those. So um, Mark, I don't think you can retire yet and just say that everything will be taken care of with close kin marker capture. Uh, I think it'll help, but it's not the silver bullet. Thanks. Rich, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and I'd agree. And But to, to layer a bit of nuance on where it helps and where it doesn't is probably helpful. And and obviously it's it's primarily focused on adults like there is there is some possible information you can get about juvenile movement in a spatial context but it's quite diffuse and you're, you're asking a lot at that point and there's probably no way in hell anyone's going to really understand what it is you're trying to do when you put all those equations together they're bloody awful but so i mean it can give you the adult dem demography and abundance and things and that's obviously really useful but yeah i mean for practical purposes you've got to you just got to say that that's what it can give you and that's not everything that you want and that means it, it can't be a silver bullet so i think it'd be hard to do it without it i would say that but i think it, you couldn't do it alone yeah i think a great example is Marina trenkel had a, a close kin marker capture of skates in bay of biscay and they sampled an offshore bank and an estuary and they found no reproductive connectivity at all. And so in sampling for close kin, they found two separate reproductive populations, but they only found that because that's where they sampled. Um, and they now needed to, if they had only sampled the offshore bank, they would have only had a population estimate for that population. And they, it couldn't have been applied to the estuaries. And they only sampled that one estuary. They didn't sample all of the estuaries where the species is. So I, I think it's a great case study that shows how close kin can help inform stock identity, but it's not, it needs to be supplemented with other things, other information. Yeah, so let's, let's have a bit more of a discussion on this. I don't understand it that much, though. Probably what I say is wrong, but um, I've always, you know, had a problem of genetics because it's, you know, a small amount of leakage of genetics will you know can can make the gene the genetic situation show that there's no um difference but that doesn't mean much for fisheries management we're talking about movement and things like that but you would think if you went out and you sampled the adults like using the japanese long line data or something back in the old days when they spread all out and randomly sampled adults there and look for um cousins you'd probably do a good job in determining what the spatial structure is and what the movement was. It just seems intuitive to me that that would work. And it's much easier to do that than it is to tag fish and recapture fish. So I'm just wondering, and of course it may not be cousins, it may be second cousins, you know, whatever, something like that. But it just makes intuitive sense that that is a way better way of doing things than the old genetics and even the tagging data. I mean, uh, never miss an opportunity to bag out a bit of genetics, not. But I think, yeah, it's. I think it's really case dependent. There's the there's the two simple answers you get from genetics, which is they're they're not different or they are different. And I think if it's that simple case, it's really easy to say that's where genetics usefulness almost stops a bit, and you need that close kin. An example would be for um, sh uh, species of shark we did in the north of Australia, where there's no genetic difference between the rivers, there's a whole bunch of rivers in the Northern Territory, but when you actually dig down into it and using mitochondrial DNA to separate male and female dispersal, 
it's uh, female Phylopatrian rivers, and essentially they're only connected by males moving between rivers. But from a conservation point of view, you have a very different view about what you need to protect those rivers versus if you just did a genetic thing and said it's the same stock. But I think going back to the, it's easier when the genetics ample answer is simple, but I think the separation by distance thing really makes it really hard and stops. Yeah, I think that's where the, the silver bullet thing rapidly falls away. Okay, any, any other comments on close kin genetics? No, Caroline, you had a question? I think uh, given this uh, dynamic uh, feature of the asset of the uh, stocks and um, the probably um, uh, encounter of different stocks in, in one jurisdiction and all that, uh, before we have MACs and operating models that are complex, maybe we can um, provide at least indicators uh, of, for example, like the do the spatial temporal model for abundance and have those maps uh, show different trends from diff for different areas so at least we are not we are still like in the known <laughs> uh, before we actually have uh, assessments or that are more complex i will even go further let's say let's split the catches by area or dynamically and just look at the data uh, with those conceptual models in mind before we even jump to uh, model it in a co more complicated way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any comments on Carolina's uh, comment? Anyone online? No. Okay. Uh, any other topics related to um, stock structure? I, I guess I've I've got a question. Um, I don't know that much about the Atlantic bluefin, but because they mix in a feeding area and have different spawning areas, there may be multiple more than two spawning areas. Um, I know the models there um, try and use genetic data, otolith chemistry, and things like that to separate out the catch. Um, has there been any development in methods that can quickly and cheaply um, differentiate between the two stocks so that you can actually get good sample sizes in terms of that catch? Um, I'll take the first swing at that. I don't know how many other ICAT people are here, but um, I'd say the answer is no, we don't have a, a great way of genetics, but not much genetic sampling, uh, otolith chemistry has been uh, useful and, and then tagging. Um, and so right now, Tom Carruthers spatial model uh, fits to all of those data. And in addition to the conventional stock assessment data, it fits to those to condition the operating models. Uh, but even those, there's the probability of classification cutoffs, um, even with the genetics. So, um, I'd have to say no, that if we sampled more with genetics, we might have what you're asking for, Mark, uh, but we have some data with a lot of uncertainty. So is that uncertainty so large that it will mess up the management of those stocks or? Certainly, and I think even Clay Port showed that back in the mid nineties, is that either ignoring movement across that line um, really failed to, you know, have it really biased our estimates of stock size and fishing mortality. Um, and it had long range um, implications, uh, particularly for rebuilding the Western population. Um, and the management procedures that were just evaluated last year um, were also um, highly influenced by movement. And so within a plausible range of movement, um, either conventional stock assessments were very sensitive to movement and the, man, the performance of management procedures are sensitive as well. But I invite others who are involved in that um, to describe that. So, so do you actually need estimates of movement or do you just need to be able to split this, the catch and the surveys into the 
stocks that you're catching? Yeah, you can do either one is that you can either assign catch to each one separately, like a Pacific salmon assessment, um, or you can use that information on mixing to estimate movement um, between them. And that's Atlantic Bluefin is doing the latter. Okay. And, and in the future, is there any new technologies or anything that are going to pro provide cheap ways of doing stock identification? I mean, is there a genetic tool that says this is east and this is west and we just take a, uh, um, like a piece of paper and stick it on the fish and, and it goes blue if it's one and red if it's the other? The closest I can think is genomics, is that genomics um, go beyond even the characters used in close kin, which um, I think Southern Bluefin initially used microsatellites um, and Mark Bravington is, is trying to push that towards um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. But genomics have taken that much one step further and really looked at, first of all, neutrality or selection and linkage, um, and they become extremely powerful. So that last year at the Stock Identification Methods Working Group, which is dominated by genetics, I thought that that might be the silver bullet, that that, you know, do, can we stop tagging? Can we stop looking at life history? And the genetics geneticists did not agree with that. They, they still said that even though genomics is probably the single most powerful tool for stock identification. It still relies on understanding dispersal at different life stages, um, uh, the movement rates, uh, the geographic range uh, in distribution. So genomics looks like a, 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 what we should be investing in, but it still needs the complementary information. Yeah, Rich. Yes, yeah, so there is some development of, of tools that will basically do what you just said, that you should be at a sample, put it in, and with a specific set of assays for a specific suite of possible stocks, it will tell you very quickly which one it is. So those, those things are there, and they, just to sort of follow on from what Steve said, so we've sort of moved, we moved from microsatellites to SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, and now we're basically moving to the genome assembly that uses the whole geography of the genome to be able to really reliably tell you not just parent offspring and half brothers and sisters, but cousins deeper into the, the past, but also that gives you such a massive amount of um, differentiation when it comes to the stocks as well. It's probably why most of the stuff is popping out now and didn't before, because <laughs> you can look deeper and look better and that suddenly this stuff's starting to pop out. So yeah, I, it can be quite dizzying talking to a geneticist about what's coming is that I'd like to know what exists now, but they like to talk about what will exist. But I think there's some interesting stuff uh, really coming on. Yeah, that's operational almost. Thanks, Rich. Okay, any other questions or comments? Let's see. No, no one online. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about whether or not um, fishery dependent data is useful at defining stock structure. Um, at least in the past, often that's the only information we have. And so we've relied on it. Um, I mean, we've in the Turner Commission, we've kind of gone the conceptual model route, which we didn't call conceptual models when we we're doing this, but we looked at everything. Um, as Carolina showed for the yellowfin tuna example. But at some stages, we were actually relying more heavily on the, the fishery data. So basically doing tree analysis of CPUE to see if there's different trends in different areas. And the assumption there was if we were getting, if there was spatial separation, we might get local depletion and therefore the trends in CPUE or the trends in abundance should be different. Um, yeah, the biologist didn't, really like that. And I'm just wondering if anyone has any opinions on whether fishery dependent data is useful in, in um, stock identification. I'll take a first swing at that. Um, I think the answer is yes. I think particularly for um, 
modeling spatial heterogeneity and selectivity and fishing mortality, it's, ne it's necessary. It may not capture some of the, um, the geographic variation in biology, um, but I think it's necessary for modeling selectivity and fishing mortality. Um, you know, the areas as fleets approach, um, I think several simulations have shown that it, it in itself, if you have really strong population structure, that areas of fleets doesn't represent all of the heterogeneity. Um, but I think if we are to have a spatially structured assessment, you still need to do what you suggested, Mark, because you still need those spatial fleet definitions um, and the fishing mortality and the spatial heterogeneity and fishing mortality needs to be modeled. So I think it's it's necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. Okay. And yeah, Carolina. Yeah, so when we used to do the the tree analysis for length frequency and for catch uh, rates, we had the idea that we will find um, boxes, right? They were static. And sometimes we like for the floating object fishery, for example, we end up with a lot of fisheries and they will still have variation in the length frequency that were not accounted for. And perhaps the new conceptual model we have that is dynamic boundaries might explain a little bit more. So we might need to go beyond just thinking it's boxes uh, and maybe look for, um, for tools that will cluster in space and time or something similar um, patterns, uh, maybe in a finer scale or something or cluster analysis, but going beyond the, the box, uh, more towards the space temporal, something like that. Okay, thanks, Carolina. Um, also to follow up on that, what what would be the oceanographic conditions which would define those boundaries? Is it oxygen layers? Is it uh, strong currents like along the equator and the EPO? Is it um, thermal fronts? Is it places where there's lots and lots of uh, eddies and stuff and versus places where there's not many? What's, what's the oceanographic conditions in a large pelagic environment that's actually going to cause these um spatial structures or really is it none of that and it's just um differences by uh, distance i'll do a first cut here i've been thinking about that and i think we have to um think about the a bit of the niche theory so what this species is adapted to like some some of the tunas they are able to go beyond the um the epipelagic zone into the mesopelagic so perhaps the structure in 3d is important for those ones but others like skipjack is not uh, a mesopelagic uh, if a frequent mesopelagic visitor so then you will have to look for a different kind of conditions for by species and according to their own uh, adaptations. Something we we don't take into account uh, much is that some tunas they develop the en endothermy uh, as they as they grow. So they, there's a moment where they they expand their niche. And uh, so those wh where are those moments? Maybe we need to think about juveniles having a certain high, uh, type of adaptations, and then the uh, as soon as they move to endothermy they will have uh, another types of adaptation. So I think we have to uh, link with the niche theory for each one of the, and, and the phys physiology of they are adapted to. I think that's a great answer um, because Mark, I think we have the data to answer your question. I mean, the, the traditional habitat suitability analyses or the niche approach that Carolina suggested but even vast, if, if we're analyzing these data with vast, let's say that, you know, the catches of tuna, even the catches by size of tuna uh, in vast, 
it's not just the time in the area that you can put into VAST, but it's basically a generalized model. So you could put oxygen and chlorophyll and any other predictor variable in there to answer your question of which are the predictors of, of tuna presence, absence, or tuna density. Um, and then, you, I mean, you can even have those in your past predictor model. Um, so you can either use VAST as an exploratory model to answer your question of which oceanographic features should we pay, be paying attention to, or you can put those into your model. And I'll just add to your EPO-centric list, Mark, um, from a far Western Pacific perspective of um, the role that sort of large land masses and islands play in, in larval retention and um, movement that we see from the tagging data for skipjack tuna as well. So I get. I guess the conceptual model should include all of these biological characteristics of the species and their habitat preference and, and exploratory analyses um, to help define how you're going to model the uh, stock structure, the spatial distribution, the, the different groups and how they might interact and whether it changes over time. I think the, the, the good thing is, is as more and more of us think about that conceptually, I mean, we are building a theory. We're building the, the, the knowledge about how these fish like work. It's, a, it's a, our, our little ecological theory about uh, tunas and, and, and uh, highly migratory species, which is gonna help all of us. Like um, the more we look at these conditions, the more may, we might be able to extrapolate to other stocks we, which we don't have as much information, for example, and we can borrow those archetypes or those conceptual models from other stocks. Okay, thanks, Carolina. Um, any other questions, comments, points on stock structure? No. Okay, looks like we've finished that one. So um, we're getting close to lunch anyway. So let's break for lunch, come back at uh, 1.30 and we're going to take up uh, spatial modeling. Well, modeling stock structure, which I guess is spatial modeling.